This is the third part in a webinar series covering the blood. And in this um, part, we're going to discuss white blood cells, but also the platelets. So I want to start with this picture of a blood smear. And I swear they must have photoshopped it because to get all of these cells in one shot is almost virtually impossible. I just had to put that out there. So I just want to kind of, while they're all here, is look at the different types because you'll be doing this in lab. You have to be able to identify certain um, white blood cells and the platelets and the red blood cells. So I want to use this picture to um, discuss it. So the little fragment that you see here, this is a platelet. You see red blood cells everywhere. So remember the most common cellular component of blood will be red blood cells. The second most common will be these platelets, which are actually fragments of cells. Then we have the white blood cells. And on this slide, you're seeing um, six different cells. So what we're going to do first is I want to discuss the cells that are referred to as granulocytes. Granulocytes have granules in their cytoplasm that, when, that, they, that stain, so they're visible. The agranulocytes are going to be over here. So they lack these granules. So the granulocytes will be the eosinophil, the neutrophil, and the basophils. So let's kind of look at how they differ. Eosinophil is referred to as eosinophil because the word literally means loving acid or loving eosin. They're acid loving. So when they're stained, the, the granules in the cytoplasm will appear very dark red. And I have a picture that even shows you even better because I mean, it depends on how old your slide is. So it may not be as, as vibrant. But the, the, the granules appear to be very dark red after staining with um, eosin, which is a red dye. The neutrophil is the granules are kind of, they're a little bit smaller. If you look real carefully, kind of there. But they're not as, as prevalent, or it's harder to see. So they're neutral to the, to the, to the stains that are in the dye. And the basophils, they literally means loving base, the bat base components in the dye that these things are stained in. And they're usually, well, I'm actually not going to go there with what they're stained in, but the, they like the base component of the, the, of the stain. And the, the granules appear to be like very dark purple or blue. So you'll notice with the... Um, Let's do the, the neutrophil first. So if you look at the neutrophil, they have very small, very pinkish granules, but very small, hard to, for most of you to, to really see. The nucleus is what's hallmark of it. It's multi-lobed. It's got a, it's also referred to, the neutrophil is referred to as a poly, polymorphonuclear leukocyte because the nucleus has multiple shapes to it. Um, in this one, it kind of, well, some of them, they look like several links of sausages together. The eosinophils have those dark red granules, and the nuclei are dark and usually bilobed. So you see kind of the, the bilobed here. Well, the basophil, with the, with the, when they're staining the granules, it's almost impossible to see the nucleus. So if you don't stain the, the uh, cell, the nucleus will be present. And if you see the, the nucleus, it will... Um, have a large bilobe um, or even a kidney-shaped nuclei. But with this stain, you just it's a being obscured. So you're just seeing all these blue dots in there. The agranulocytes will include the lymphocytes, and the monocytes. So monocytes are like, I would say, the monsters of the cell, mono monster. They're very large, they're agranular leukocytes, and they, their nuclei are variable, variable shaped. Almost in this one looks kind of kidney shaped, but the cells are extremely large. The lymphocytes are agranular again. 
but they're um, they're pretty small. They're almost is in some instances to be the size of the red blood cell. So they're relatively small. The um, the new or the nuclei are sometimes so large that all you really see is either a very thin rim of cytoplasm around her, and sometimes it's hard even to see it. Over here, this is another neutrophil. So so you know that's another that, that's another neutrophil. Um, because you see kind of one, two, three, so it's multiple, sh multiple shaped nuclei. So what we're going to do is, you know, you have a chart in your notes. I'll have you fill in based on what you think is important for the different white blood cells. But I do want to emphasize this thing over here, that of the white blood cells, the most common are the neutrophil. You will have no problem finding a neutrophil on the blood smear. The second most common will be the lymphocytes. So this would be the first, second, then the monocytes, followed by eosinophils and the basophils. You will struggle to find eosinophils and basophils. Basophils, to me, are the hardest to find, but you know, every once in a while we're lucky and we can find them. So these are like the, the distribution. Now the the relative amounts of the different white blood cells. So we're saying this is a differential percentage. Um, the under certain conditions, uh, you the proportion or relative proportions of those leukocytes can change, and so clinically, information about the relative proportions of these white blood cells is very useful. So we see this is the differential um, percentage in a normal individual, but it can change under certain conditions. Before we go over each individually, I want to do collectively kind of some of the functions of the white blood cells. Some of the white blood cells are phagocytes, so literally cell eaters. The monocytes are very important cell eaters, phagocytes. They're um, in tissues, they will become what referred to as macrophage. And the neutrophils and the eosinophils are referred to as being microphage. They are also phagocytes. So they will be, all these have the ability to engulf a debris or cells. The new, the, or say the leukocytes, they differ from red blood cells in that they have nuclei and they have organelles. Remember, the red blood cells don't have those. They have to have these because they're going to be responsible for forming a number of different substances which will aid them in defending our bodies against disease-causing things and we refer to as being pathogens. They're going to be important in if you injured yourself, they'll help remove waste products or damaged cells or abnormal and well damaged cells but they're also going to be important in removing any like abnormal cells such as maybe cancer cells so they're um, important in defense in general and we should say defense and immunity they have there's a couple terms that I want you to, to look at is these terms diapedesis and chemotaxis the cells kind of, if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I recommend you Google, is look up what an amoeba, how it moves. So they say they exhibit amoeboid movement. So they kind of, they, it's, it's hard to, to explain. It's better to see. So if you want to Google it, you can. They undergo a process called diapedesis, which you see right over here, in which they squeeze through the walls of the blood cell to enter tissues. So under certain conditions, they're going to need, be needed, so they'll squeeze through these blood, the the openings in red blood or not red blood cells, capillaries, and get into tissues. And what kind of draws them in or attracts them is something referred to as positive chemotaxis. So I'm going to put positive here, positive chemotaxis. Number of mediators can be released by tissues and other blood cells in the area which will attract more and more leukocytes to the area in which we need some help to remove some bacteria or fix up some damaged uh, cells or tissues. So they exhibit um, we call positive chemotaxis. 
So we're going to do first is we're going to do the granulocytes first. So remember, the granulocytes are referred to, are the neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the basophils. These two are the agranulocytes. So the granulocytes have that granular cytoplasm. So we'll do neutrophils first. So neutrophils, these guys, I'm not going to go over like the structure again, so you can go, rewind if you want to look, go over the structure. Plus, we're going to do this in lab. So your instructor will go over how, what you're looking for to be able to identify a neutrophil. Now, neutrophils are phagocytic. That's important to remember, and it's, you see that is in bold in your notes. So it's important to know that they're phagocytic. They are um, very important in acute bacterial infections, and you have this whole laundry list of stuff that it does. You can read, so I'm not going to bore you by going over each, each step, but they're going to be very important in um, the immune, or not say in um, protection against um, pathogens or microorganisms. They're part of what we're going to refer to as the nonspecific defenses or innate immunity. Um, they work overtime. They, they're so important early on that they kind of burn themselves out. So they're very short-lived once they're working. But thing is, when they, as they're burning themselves out, they release a lot of factors that attracts more and more phagocytes into the area. So those mediators that, that um, promote positive chemotaxis, they're going to be released by these neutrophils. The um, next one are the eosinophils. So this picture is even better. You see how dark red or even almost like salmon color. The, you see the bilobed um, nucleus, but and you see these dark red granules. The eosinophils are... In those granules, it has a number of different components to it, but I'm only going to talk about a, a, um, like one of them. Is they one of the things that are found in those granules is histamine. So they they release histamine, and they'll be a, a, a component of um, allergic reactions. They uh, the the mass or not the muscles. The granules also have substances that help to kill parasites. So they're very important in parasitic infections. So when they, when we call degranulation, so they, when the, the granules kind of open and burst, the substances are toxic to parasites, but they also could be toxic to host tissues. So they're going to damage a lot of tissues. Um, so they're responsible in part with, for allergic reactions as well as the basophils. So basophils and eosinophils are kind of work have similar functions. They both, we're going to talk about both release histamine. They're also um, going to, uh, since they're ma or phagocytic, is they like to eat substances that are coated with antibodies. Antibodies are released by our immune system, or their immune cells, or which is our specific um, defense system. And it's the B lymphocytes that um, are going to be involved in antibody production. But I always say that when antibodies kind of surround or coat an abnormal cell, um, something that's not supposed to be there, it makes it much more appetizing for phagocytes to eat it. So um, I wanted to mention that because we'll talk about that when we do the immune system. So they definitely like things that are coated with antibodies. The last uh, granulocyte is the, the basophil. So the basophil is our least common of all the white blood cells. But they, those granules release histamine just like the eosinophil. And histamine is a, one of the things it does, it's a vasodilator. So it helps to improve blood flow to tissue to help promote um, things getting there and try to fix the tissue. But histamine, is um, going to be involved in general in inflammation. It will be a mediator in allergic reactions though too. And one of the other things that are found in those granules is heparin. Heparin is an anticoagulant which inhibits blood clotting. clotting. So what it does is it keeps blood clotting from, from, or say clotting too quickly. Maybe we don't really need it in, um, in a certain area. Um, the basophils, if they leave the bloodstream, 
they will develop into mast cells. So mast cells really are B cells, or not B cells, sorry, basophils. And so they're, they have the same components to it. Um, one thing I do want you to add to your notes, because it will be important when we do the immune system, on the basophil, they have a receptor on their cell surface that binds to IgE. So put that in there, that has a receptor on its cell surface that binds IgE, because that will help us later when we discuss the immune system. Let's do the agranulocytes, the monocytes and the lymphocytes. The monocytes you said are the very large ones. They're very important phagocytes. They're going to be extremely important in, as we call, antigen-presenting cells. These aren't the only ones. I just kind of purposely didn't mention them early on, but when we do immune system, I will. They're, for, they're going to present the antigen to, or possible antigens to the um, components of our specific defense system. We talk about the lymphocytes. So these are very important antigen presenting cells. Monocytes that left the bloodstream and go into the tissues are going to be referred to as macrophage. So macrophage really are tissue monocytes. So they're just referred to as macrophage. They will be elevated under certain um, conditions, and you can read them. It's in your notes, so typhoid fever and malaria and mono. Um, so you can read that on your own. And the last ones are the lymphocytes. So the lymphocytes, there's more than one type. There's, uh, for example, there's T lymphocytes, there's B lymphocytes. On, when I look at a, a, a blood smear, I can't tell you the difference between a B cell or a T cell. I'm sure someone probably could figure it out, but I can't do it. The lymphocytes in general, these are going to be part of your specific defenses or immunity. Oops, can't spell. Or immunity. Um, these are the ones that will live the longest. You have lymphocytes that have lived for years. The other ones don't live quite as, as long. But these are the longest living of all the white blood cells. And the B cells, or the B lymphocytes, let's say B cells, they produce antibodies, which will be an important component of our specific defense systems. But the T cells, or the T lymphocytes, will be in very important components in our immune system, and we'll discuss that a little bit more in depth in class. So we have... You're looking at a blood smear, and you're looking at um, the white blood cells and the red blood cells and the platelets, is if someone does a differential white cell count, what they're trying to do is what's the relative proportion of the white cells? We know what its normal distribution is. If it's abnormal, it can indicate certain conditions. But let's just, just do in general, is if they're counting the white blood cells within a smear, they know what the normal range in a cubic millimeter is like a microliter. It's a very small amount. If someone has leukopenia, that means their white cell count is less than 5,000 per cubic millimeter of blood. Leukocytosis is if the white cell count is greater than 10,000. So leuco, remember, means white. Pina is condition of the blood in which it's, 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 it's deficient. So it's, it's, we have too few white blood cells. Leukocytosis is just like you're making, you got way too many white blood cells in that sample. Leuke, or leukemia is a condition in which you have abnormal or uncontrolled production of specific types of immature leukocytes. So I'll, I'll repeat myself again. Leukemia is, an, is a condition in which you have an abnormal or uncontrolled production of specific types of immature leukocytes. So the term leukemia comes from leuke, meaning white. Eme is, refers to a blood, and in, in the IA is a condition. So condition of the blood, kind of like white blood. It's because we have way too many white blood cells. But what's different from leukocytosis is that leukemia, these Blood cell, or these white blood cells are immature. And there are a couple types. I do want to differentiate between a couple types of leukemias. We have myeloid or myelogenous leukemia. 
and we have lymphocytic leukemias. The dif differentiation is the my myeloid leukemias, the, the change begins within the myeloid stem cells. Lymphocytic, the change is begins in the lymphoid st stem cells, and we're gonna, you have a picture in your notes that's gonna look at lymphoid stem cells in the myeloid stem cells. So a, the, the leukemia is actually a type of cancer, but it affects bone marrow and it affects the blood. So if we do a differential white blood cell count, they are going to determine the percentage of the different white blood cell or the white blood cells. And remember, a certain conditions will cause like preponderance of eosinophils or, or monocytes. So if someone's having a, an allergic reaction, the eosinophil levels may be elevated, or the basophil levels will may, may be elevated. If someone's has acute bacterial infection, the neutrophils levels will be elevated. So let's just look at this picture, just so I can sh show you the difference between myeloid and lymphoid. You've seen it before when we did red blood cells. Remember, all the blood cells originate from the red bone marrow, and it's really flat bones in adults, mostly flat bones, even though you're depicting, the picture depicts the proximal epiphysis of a long bone. In adults, the majority of our blood cells originate in f the red marrow of flat bones, and the cell is every, all the cells, blood cells, originate from hemocytoblasts. Then we've got two stem cells. We either have myeloid stem cells or lymphoid stem cells. All of the formed elements of the blood, except for the lymphocytes, will come from the myeloid stem cells. The lymphocytes are the only ones that come from the lymphoid stem cells. The um, one interesting thing is the lymphoid stem cells can migrate out and populate other tissues such as the thymus or the spleen. And so we can have development of the lymphocytes in other organs, but they originated, the stem cell originated in the bone marrow. The macrophage, or which is the macrophage, the monocyte here is interesting too in that its development, it develops outside the bone marrow. The, you get early development in, but later the final ultimate um, development occurs outside the bone marrow. Now, I had mentioned before when we did red blood cells that the final maturation of red blood cell occurs in the circulation, but the majority of it did take place in the bone marrow. Now, if you look at the, the, the picture, you have all these little circles. And what the circles are, are trying to depict different factors that will promote production of certain of the blood cells. And earlier when we did red blood cells, this red were the, was erythropoietin, so we won't talk about that. We've already talked about it. Is we have various stimulating factors, or they call them colony stimulating factors, or this is the abbreviation for colony stimulating factor, is they will activate various stem cells to increase their production. So, for example, we have a macrophage colony stimulating factor, which is, would be found right here. So this would be the macrophage colony stimulating factor. It promotes the production of the monocytes. The, another one would be granulocyte colony, colony stimulating factor. It promotes, it's right here, the proliferation of all the granulocytes. And these are your three Granulocytes. So it makes sense if you kind of know what granulocytes are. Granul granulocyte colony stimulating factor stimulates the production or proliferation of the granulocytes, eosinophils, basophils, and the neutrophils. The granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor is right here. So you notice it stimulates the production of both granulocytes and the macrophage or sorry, macrophage colony stimulating factor. And then we're left with one more. This is up at, is, uh, sorry, responsible for proliferation of all the, the cells besides the, um, the lymphocytes is it's multi colony stimulating factor. 
So that's going to even affect the red blood cells. So I want to kind of, I wanted to mention these because it's knowing that different factors stimulate the production of different cells, we have used that to our advantage. So an example would be if someone decides to be a donor for someone that needs a stem cell transplant. And um, things have improved a lot. Um, they can, if someone decides to be a donor, they actually don't have to go right into the marrow anymore. They can actually harvest some of these cells from the bloodstream, the peripheral blood, which is very cool. And so it's a little bit less invasive as it used to be. Um, and if someone's going to be a donor, is they will inject them with something called, write it out first, Phil grass stem, stem is in stimulate. This is an analog of the granulocyte um, colony stimulating factor. And so they will do this uh, to try to promote production of um, certain blood cells. But there's other, um, let's say, synthetically formed um, stimulating factors that they can administer to indiv certain individuals if they need to promote the production of certain of these blood cells. Another one, uh, one that I know of, is there's something called Nupagen. And you see how it says new in front of it? This is a um, granulocyte colony stimulating factor that increases the production of neutrophils. They usually give this to some patients that are undergoing chemotherapy, so it improves their chances of fighting off some of the infections that they can get. Now the last thing we're going to talk about is platelets. So platelets are these right here. They are just fragments of this huge looking thing. This is a megakaryocyte. So, um, and you have megakaryocytes, I don't have to write it out in your notes. Um, the, there's a couple things that promote the production of it. Um, one of them would be that multi-colony stimulating factor and something called thrombopoietin. Um, remember platelets, when we did an earlier webinar, the, are referred to as thrombocytes. And thrombocytes is a term generally referred to as the platelets in non-mammalian vertebrates, but we have, knowing that term thrombocyte is important when we give you some definitions. We still utilize that term in some conditions referring to platelets. The platelets will be the second most common cellular component of the blood. Red blood cells being number one, platelets number two. They're going to be very, very, very important in hemostasis. So to try and prevent blood loss. So they release substances to help with um, blood clotting. They're going to be in, important in, in forming what we call a platelet plug. And actually, let me see, I think I have some of these here. Yes, so here. So these guys, this temporary patch is a platelet plug. And the last webinar will cover hemostasis, so we'll talk about these more um, in depth. Um, they have chemicals involved in clotting, because that's one of the steps involved in hemostasis is forming a blood clot. They're also going to help in kind of getting the clot a little bit smaller, because at some point you want to... To, to fix the problem, like if you, if you cut yourself, you're going to repair the damage to the blood vessel, and they're, they're going to be involved in contracting after a clot is formed to help to pull the ends of the vessel together. These guys, because they don't, they're, they're just fragments of cells. They don't circulate very long before they're removed by the phagocytic cells. So they're just, you're constantly kind of replacing these platelets. Now, if a person has a low platelet count, it's referred to as thrombocytopenia. That's where understanding what thrombocyte means. High platelet count is thrombocytosis. So if you've already seen leukocytosis, where they had too many um, white blood cells, thrombocytosis, too many platelets. Well, what's the causes and the consequences? Well, low platelet count, causes could be either destruction or inadequate production 
of platelets. Consequences. If I have a low platelet count, I'm going to bleed, have a tendency to bleed in tissues, or I'll have slow clotting after an injury. You're going to see them easily bruise. So it is going to impair their ability to um, stop blood loss. Someone who is thrombocyto has thrombocytosis, it could be caused by um, some instances inflammation, cancers, some of the conditions referred to as myeloproliferative disorders. So remember, these are derived from myeloid stem cells. That's why they call it myeloproliferative disorders, diseases. They can overproduce um, platelets. Often, though, with people with high platelet counts, most often no treatments necessary unless the platelet numbers get over. So you see here the number they st they start getting over about 750,000. So I mean, it, often they don't really worry about it as much until it's about over 750,000 or a million per mil uh, cubic millimeter. Um, and or they have other risk factors for thrombosis. So if they um, have high platelet counts and they have known risk factors for um, forming clots, thrombosis or blood clots, they will, uh, there is various treatments available to them. So this will be the last part of this third part um, series on blood. The very last one, we're going to go further in depth about the platelets and talk about hemostasis.